I, I was looking while y'all see me running around. I was looking for a prayer cloth. When we were going to the attorney center, we met a man down there by the name of Jerry Camus. You've heard us speak his name, and Daniel knows him very well. And um, he, I talked to Brother Hillis this morning, and I just felt led to, and Sister Karen's been helping me look up some resources for him. And I didn't know this, but the man has cancer now. Served in Vietnam. Come in, got accused of a, an, his wife and, and of abusing his daughters, which was not true. Never, no DNA, nothing to confirm it or anything. And got the book thrown at him. Um, and now he has cancer. It's spread on his body. And we're going to be praying for him. And we're going to believe for a miracle. And so here's what I prayed the Lord this morning. I said, Lord... He's, he's went through hell and back in Vietnam. He got here and got thrown in prison for something he didn't even do. And he served 27 years or more at this point. Yeah, 30 maybe. Which is terrible. And I said, if you want to take him out of his misery, that's fine. And if the greater miracle would be to raise him up and give him a complete clean, healthy body and deliver him from prison, that would be okay with me. <laughs> so we're going to be praying for him and we're going to send him a prayer cloth and let him know that, uh, you know, we're, we're still praying for him. Amen. So I was looking for one of our little prayer cloths, but I couldn't find one here. But we're going to be, y'all be praying. His name is Jerry. So be praying for him. In the meantime, Lord, we just want to look to your word and we just ask that you direct us. Guide us and lead us and let us just come to know you in a real and personal way. When you study the uh, Old Testament, and, this, and Paul said in the New Testament that the things that happened were examples for us and things that we needed to learn from. And so when you read that, you, you learn God. You learn his ways. You learn his purpose. You learn things that God is just exact. And he does it on purpose. <laughs> it just wasn't something that he thought about, you know, and said, you know what, I think I'll do that. He has a purpose and a plan. And when you think about that, and I'm going to, before I get into my lesson, I'm going to uh, just throw this all at you. Palm Sunday is, I think, next Sunday. Is that right? Not this Sunday, but the next Sunday, right? The 14th, I believe. Anybody know what Palm Sunday is about? What is it? All right, on the fourth, I mean, on the tenth day of the month of Nisan, which is our April, they were to select a lamb without blemish, spotless, holy, and they were to put that lamb up because on the fourteenth they were to sacrifice it in the evening, and the fifteenth was the Passover. All right, what that represents is that Jesus was the selected lamb to be slain. So he came in on the 10th, according to history, riding on a donkey that had never been ridden. Why a donkey? If you will go back to Exodus 12 and 13, you will find out that if the first thing they said, the Lord said, the first male that is born unto you, you offer it wholly to the Lord. If it's a donkey, you redeem it by a lamb, with a lamb. So the lamb redeemed the donkey. And that's what that represents. Isn't it amazing when you study it and find out that even the dunk, but it had to be one that had never been ridden, had to be pure, and so he was. He, he was uh, untrained, but, he, but Jesus rode in on something. The lamb redeemed the donkey. That was symbolic of what, you know, because God knew that this animal was the first one, and it had to be a male, and so it was, it was amazing when you study all of that out. Everything is exact with God. 
It's amazing that he puts everything in place. And when you study it out, I never, never, it's never ceased to amaze me. But we're going to the book of Daniel, and then we're going uh, to um, the book of Chronicles. And in the book of Daniel chapter 1, I, I said, Lord, if you loved Israel, then what are they doing in Babylon? What are they doing? Why are these young men that are so capable, they're, they're the king's seed. Why are they doing in Babylon? But let's go back to Daniel 1. And I'm going to just hit a, a couple of scriptures. We read it all last week. Okay, it's the third year reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And so Nebuchadnezzar has invaded Jerusalem. And, and notice verse 3. And the king spake to his Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, and said that certain of the children of the king's seed. And so they were to be taught and trained for three years in the ways of Babylon or the Chaldeans. And so, but look verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor the wine, or so forth. He wouldn't defile himself. And so God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the eunuch, and of course he granted him his request. But let's look at this young man. Now, I don't know how exactly how old Daniel was. Some said he was about 16 or so, and, and I'll, I'll buy that. A young man. But how could a young man of 16 be so purposed in his heart? There had to have been some training. There had to have been some exposure to the ways of God. There had to be something in his background that gave him the ability to make this decision. Not just that he was of the king's seed or the royal heritage that he had, but something was there. And so I look back in Chronicles and I found out some things that had happened. So if you will... You will turn to Second Chronicles. And this is going to teach us some things about serving God. I mean, we, we've got to purpose in our hearts to serve God on purpose. Amen? A lot of people take church for granted, God for granted, serving God for granted. They ride on grace rather than purpose. Now, thank God for grace. I mean, by grace we're saved through faith. And it's a gift from God. Everything we've done, we receive from the Lord. But we, need, we don't need to take anything for granted and say, well, God will just forgive me. You know, it's just me. I'm just human. And we give all kinds of excuses for our failing. Well, everybody sins a little more or less every day and all that's kind of a term that you... But how about determining in your heart to serve God? How many will serve God on purpose? I love him because he first loved me. I'm going to love him. I'm going to have a plan. I'm, I'm going to seek after God. It's time to come and seek God, the prophet said, until he reigns us with righteousness. Reigns righteousness down on us. I'm going to serve God regardless. And so he purposed that he wouldn't. Well, when we turn back to the book of Chronicles, which gives us the lineage of the kings, we know how that David and, and uh, then Solomon. Now, David took the throne in about 1000 B.C. and then Solomon followed him. But then after that, in the route the 900 B.C.s, uh, the kingdom split and, the, and they were divided. And so when you read in, in both... Israel, the nation of Israel, which was ten kingdoms, and Judah, which was two. You'll read things like this, and, and king so-and-so, or so-and-so took the throne, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. You see, leadership determines what the followers do. So when you're in leadership, God expects us to be a leader. He expects us to be purposed 
And Paul says, make your calling an election sure. You got to know that you know that you know that you've called, that you're saved, that you're serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That when you're in leadership, you've got to make decisions based on what our Father wants us to do rather than what we choose to do in life. The Bible says we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which is God's. We represent a heavenly kingdom, and we have a king that's over us, and we need to serve him with purpose. We're not a subject that just is made to do something, we're a subject that's willing to do something. And we've got to do that. So when we make decisions, it affects everybody around us in leadership. James says that teachers and leaders, there's greater expectation of them than just someone who is not in that position. How we dress, how we conduct ourselves... In, in every position of life, and everywhere we go, there's more expected of us. But as the kings went on, and then <clears throat> we find in, in the Second Chronicles chapter 34, we're going to pick it up in, at, at Josiah. Uh, this was a king that started reigning when he was eight years old. And I'm going to go through this and just get to the high points. Um, there had been sin in Israel for almost 300 years. Very little bit, very few of the kings tried to tear down the groves of idols and tried to build up. But this young man was six years old when he began to reign. And he reigned uh, 31 years. 31 years. So he, at 31, he was 8, so he'd be 39, died a young man. But I want, I want to bring that to you in just in a little bit. 39, and then his son at some point took over. In the 8th year, he was 16. He was young, and he began to seek the Lord. He began to seek after the God of, uh, of David, his father. And in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places in the groves and the carved images, the molded images. In other words, at 16, he set his heart. And four years later, at 20, he began to realize, we serve God, we don't serve these idols. Begin to tear them all down. Now, uh, you know, the fact, not the fact that he was 20, got the job done, but the fact that he was king. He carried authority. So you see, it doesn't matter whether you've been serving God one day or 20 years. When you're in the kingdom and you're under a king, you've got the authority of the king. Even from day one, when you get saved, you step under the authority. So he's, he's in authority now. And so they broke down the altars of Balaam, then his presence, the images, and so forth. And, and then he burnt the bones of the priest. In other words, he took down all of the, the, um, the idols and the priests that served them and everything. He, he cleaned house. Okay. Now let's go um, in verse 7. He cut down all the idols throughout the land of Israel. He returned to Jerusalem. In other words, he went into Israel. Those that surrounded Judah, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and Simeon, and Naphtali, those that nations that were surrounding them, he took down their idols too. In other words, he said, I'm not only going to clean my house, I'm going to clean those that surrounded me. I'm going to get this thing cleaned up. So when we start out to do that, let's just do a full job, right? Let's get it done. All right, he returned to Jerusalem in the 18th year, he's 26 now, of his reign. He purged the land, the house, and so forth. And now the next job is, let's get the house of God straightened out. He went from cleansing the idols. In other words, you've got to get rid of sin, but you've got to replace it with God and his word. 
And so now he said, I'm going to work on them and repair the house of the Lord. And so he began to repair the house. And, and so they began to gather the money uh, and, and so forth. In verse 12, and the men did the work faithfully. And they were overseers that took care of it. And though that were skilled in the ability to clean and to work on the house, they did that. And they brought the money and, and they got the things together, the money, the resources, the people. And, and so forth. Then they went into the house of the Lord and they found the book, verse 15. And Hilkiah, Hilkiah answered and <coughs> said to <coughs> Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book. Somebody say, I found the book. <laughs> have you found the book? Of oh, the book, see. He said, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. <coughs> So he delivered the look to Shophan, carried it to the king, and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servant, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and delivered it to the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. And so then uh, Hilkiah, Hilkiah, the priest had given me a book. And so Shaphan, he began to read it before the king, verse 19. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. If you'll turn to Deuteronomy 28, there's the blessings and there's the curses. God said, if you obey me, this is what I'm going to do for you. If you disobey me, this is what's going to happen. So why was Daniel and the king's seed in Babylon? Israel and Jerusalem and Judah had disobeyed God. They had walked into sin. I'm telling you, the Bible says the wages, the payment of sin is death. But thank God, the gift of God is what? Eternal life. So we have a choice. He said, I put before you life and death. Choose life that you can live or you can choose the other way and die. Now, God is exact. He don't play with sin. He don't mess around with our excuses. Because there is grace sufficient for us to live for Him in righteousness and true holiness. If we could see, uh, the mindset of the church is... Well, everybody does it. Nobody's really, you know, I'm, I'm as good as this one or I'm doing as good as that one or, you know, but let's, let's get like a Daniel. Daniel and three of the boys that came with him were the only ones that the book of Daniel said they purposed. They stood fast. When the three Hebrew children were, were challenged, you got to bow down to that image when you hear the music. Or you're going into the fiery furnace. Now there's determined. They said, well, we don't know if our God will or not. But I'm going to tell you one thing. We're not bound down. We wouldn't have had that story if they had bowed down. When Daniel was challenged, it's the lion's den. Or you bow down. You quit praying to your God. Daniel said, that doesn't bother me. Throw me there. He went as time three times a day, knelt down, opened his window toward Jerusalem, and they heard him praying. They went to the king and said, He's he's messed up. We got him now. King said, You know what? I'm sorry I did that. I didn't know I was trapped into doing something that would cause Daniel to be thrown in the den. Walked all night. King didn't sleep. Walked the floor. Went running down there early. Said, Daniel, did your God deliver you? Daniel said, Take heart. The angels slept with the lions, and I slept with them. See, we've got to be that determined to serve God. There's a challenge going out today, and God's calling His people to serve Him. With all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your... Love Him. Just just commit to Him. God, and I'll not bow down. I'll not bend. I'll not bow. I'm not going to let anything 
deter me from serving God. So when he heard this, he rent his clothes, he repented. And he called the priest and he said, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in the book. He said, the generation before me have not kept it. And so they, the king of the point went to Huldah the prophetess. So women, you know, she got a word for him. And she said, go tell the men that sent you. So you see, we have a right to carry the word of the Lord. And if you want to argue with God, go at it. Be my guest. Okay? Alright. Tell the men that sent you to me, thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. As for the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord's, so shall you say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because thine heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humbled thyself before me, and did rend your clothes and weep before me, I have even heard you also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place, and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. And so he gathered all the Israels together, and the king went into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests, and the Levites, and all the people, great and small, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of, of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes, with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in the book. And he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it or to take their stand. He challenged them to do the work of the, of the will of the Lord. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God and of God their fathers. And Josiah took away all, all of the abominations out of the countries and pertained to Israel. Okay. And all of his days um, they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. All the days of Josiah the king, he kept God in the forefront. But let me, let me go back to the word. He said, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself and you repented. He said, I will not bring it all up on your day. I'm going to tell you that humility will delay the judgment. That's why he said, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... And I will hear from heaven and I will heal it. A humble heart will delay judgment. But if we walk on in, because it said pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When we are pride, when pride is entered in and we will not humble ourselves before God and repent, when we know that we have done wrong, then we're headed... For judgment. This nation, the only way this nation, there's two reasons why this nation is saved. The church is alive and well. I'm not saying that everybody that goes to church is perfect, but there's some prayers going up in this nation. The second reason is we defend Jerusalem, Israel. We're blessed because we support Israel. Now you can take you you can take that up with the word of God, but I'm gonna tell you that's exactly I was studying this and God said, You know what? 
The economy in this nation is booming again. Why is it booming? Because someone had the audacity to say, I'm standing with Israel. Not because we're so smarter than anybody else, but because we defend Israel. That's exactly why we're but And you watch it. If we continue to do that and stand with Israel, stand with their defense, God said, I will bless them that bless Israel. And he will do it. But when they take their stand and say, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm going to defend and, and, and let Israel be trampled underfoot, watch this nation go to pot. If I can use that word. You'll go down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And from then on, the economy went down. And in the next administration, it went down further. And there was more people on food stamps under the, the previous administration than had ever been in this nation. 47 million people on food stamps. Now... It's not that way. It's not that bad. The economy's coming up. I'm not defending a political status. I'm just telling you it's because we defend Israel. And we'll be blessed. And this nation, two reasons. The church is praying, and I believe that. And, but importantly, we defend Israel as a nation. We're the one nation that will defend them. And we've got to stand there. Um, that's God. He's exact, and he never fails. Okay, let's go on. Okay, and so then they had, the, in, the, in chapter 35, they had a Passover that exceeded all Passovers. <laughs> all right. He said there was never one like it before, and there never was one like it. Okay, but let, let's see. All right, let me, let me go where I see if I am. Uh like look at verse 19 in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 35. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. And he went on to tell you how he prepared it and so forth. But after that Passover, after he had humbled himself, after the Passover, after holding people to the word of God and demanded that they honor God in every way, he made one bad decision. I preached a message one time years ago when I was more of an evangelist than I am a teacher. A moment of weakness, a lifetime of regret. Here he had, eight years old, took the throne. How many eight years old can take the throne of a kingdom? Sixteen, he began to seek God. At twenty, he began to tear down. At 26, he began to repair the church. They got, the, I mean, the temple. They got everything in place. Everything is good. But Egypt come up and was going to destroy another nation. And he said, he didn't like it. And it's, it's After all this, when Josiah prepared the temple, Nico, that's, that's Pharaoh Nico in, in uh, some other verses, king of Egypt came up to fight against a car uh, commission um, by the Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. But the kings of the Pharaoh sent ambassadors to him, saying, "What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war." In other words, I'm going to have the problem with you. I've got a problem with this other nation. Don't fight me. Let it go. He said, for God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God. Ooh. Don't mess with God, he said. In other words, I have, I have, a, I have a, a, an assignment from God to go after this nation. And don't mess with me, and don't mess with God. Who is with me that he destroy thee not? Nevertheless... Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him and hearken not unto the words of an echo from the mouth of God and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot him 
and killed him and his servants took him away and he died and he was buried in the sepulchres of his fathers and all Israel mourned for a righteous king who at 31 years old made a foolish I mean 30 uh, 39 years old made a very foolish decision You say, what's, what's this all about? God expects us to obey His Word. And He will not go against our will. He didn't snatch Him out of the chair and say, Josiah, get on your throne and get out of you. You're not a man of war. You're a leader. But you need to be there. But, and then there's a couple more kings. They, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then we come down to Jehoiakim. He was eight years old and he began to reign. And he reigned three months and ten days. He didn't get in there long, did he? I'm on 36 now. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then Nebuchadnezzar made three invasions into Israel and Jerusalem and took them captive. And that's why Daniel wound up where he was. In Babylon because of sin people wind up where they are because of what sin see we we are oftentimes in our positions because of our own decisions and not the decision that God would have us to make this is the whole lesson this morning is, you know, we need to seek after God. Seek after God. Get into the Word. What, what, what you know, any situation, I'm, I'm a firm believer that God answers prayer. Are you? Absolutely. Well, I don't know how to pray sometime. Anybody know always how to pray for your situation? I don't know how to pray sometimes. So what do I do is I go to God and I say, Lord, I know your Word. But I don't know how to pray. Now, instead of me praying a certain way, then you talk to me. Give me understanding. And I don't always get it the first time I pray. So I keep praying till I get peace and I get direction. And then I pray. I'm telling you, that seeking God is not coming in and saying, Lord, I just bless your name. I thank you, Lord, for what your blessings I did. No, seeking God is saying, not my will, but thine be done. Seeking God is saying, Lord, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. What have you designed? What have you required? What have you said? What have you done? What is your purpose for me? What am I supposed to do in this situation? Have I always done it? No, because I didn't really understand. But this morning I'm telling us, we got to get serious with God. And you're serious with God is when you get into His Word and study all the details. And, and as we study the book of Daniel, we will find out that as they went through things that we've mentioned, a few of them, but after 70 years, he was, see, Jeremiah lived in this day, Ezra. And, and Daniel saw the return once, the first time Ezra went back. I mean, excuse me, the first time it was, was Zerubbabel, he went down to rebuild the temple. The first thing they had to do is establish. I'm not, I don't, you can look in Ezra. Ezra will tell you about it. But after 70 years, the first thing you'll want to do is get the temple, the spiritual side right. And that's what we need to do. And, and you know, instead of judging someone else about what they're right and wrong, we need to make sure our temple's right. We need to make sure that nothing, that no one or nothing, and, and I'm not really concerned, and I don't mean this to be ugly to anybody, but I'm not really concerned what you think about me. I want to be right with him you know because you might see something in me that God doesn't see in me or you may judge something in me that me and God's already corrected so we need we need to realize that but they went by the first thing they did let's get the temple right 
But they did not complete everything. So Ezra went back with the law, and then Nehemiah, Nehemiah went back, rebuilt the city and the government. And you've got to have it all. You've got to have the spiritual side. You've got to have the word. You've got to have the spirit in the word. And you've got to have some governing factors in your life. They've got to be established according to the word of God. If God says, thou shalt not steal, you, need, you don't need to go around stealing. And that's anything, right? You know what I mean? So, we, we, I, I'm just encouraging us this morning. I may sound like I'm mad at you, but I'm not. <laughs> I may sound a little oh, strong in what I'm saying here. But why was he in Babylon? He wasn't in Babylon for anything he had done. He was in Babylon for what his ancestors had done. Who's following us? I don't want my children and grandkids or, or somebody that I've had a, a part of their life to be in bondage because I didn't live right. If you look back in your life, and I'm not putting you in condemnation, I'm just saying, let's get it changed. If you look back in your life and say, you know what? If my parents had been serving God and their parents had been serving God and their parents had been serving God, I'll guarantee you that many of you had not gone through what you've gone through in your life. Life would have been different. Amen. But you can't change that. You can't change anything. But you can change today for your tomorrow. Amen. And God is a God of mercy. He reaches out. He's able to save to the uttermost them that come to him. It doesn't make a difference what you've done in your past. If it's under the blood, God, God is not holding it against you. He's cast it as far from you as the east is from the west. Never, everybody say never, never. to be remembered against you again. God chooses to forget it. It's washed clean. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. If you come to the blood, it's cleansed. And yesterday is yesterday. Amen. And now you can believe God to reach out and correct and make. He said, behold, I make all things new. You're a new creation. And your life is now changed. And you can walk with him. But you've got to be determined. You've got to purpose in your heart. You've got to be persuaded, God, I'm going to stand for you. I'm going to live for you. You're going to correct me. I'm going to correct everything in my life that's wrong. I don't care what I call it. I don't care what I'm saying it is. I don't care if I, you know, with this business, I can't help it. I'm, not, I'm going to quit that. I'm not saying, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm not saying I'm doing the best I can. I'm not, Lord, I just want you to make me a temple that you will live in and that others following me can see the Lord in me. Amen. And that's when you sell out to God. That's when you give it all to him and say, I'm all, Lord, yours. I don't care what you have to do to me. Get me right. Yes, Lord. And when he gets you right... You'll live at peace with God, even with your enemies. <laughs> when a man's ways please the Lord, God said, I'll even make you enemies to be at peace with you. You'll have favor everywhere you go. Everything you do. You know why? Because when you're under the hand of the Almighty God, who is a good God, your enemies are coming up against it. And any weapon that's formed against you, whether it's sickness, whether it's financial, whether it's family, they're up against it if they want to mess with God's kids. I'm t but you've got to get it right first. Got to clean it up. You've got to tear down all your altars, tear down all the idols, tear down all the junk, tear down all the pride. <laughs> tear down and say, God, just, you know... Tear me down and build me up a new creation in you. Let's stand. Hallelujah.